Really wonderful to have you here. Great. Um, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I'm really excited to have you all here to discuss uh, a new report uh, that we've just published at the Teaching Systems Lab that was led by Natasha Estevez with a terrific team of other researchers um, called The Teachers Have Something to Say. Lessons learned from US PK 12 teachers during the COVID impacted 2021 year. Um, I think as a place to start, we'll just ask folks to introduce themselves. I think what would be great would actually to be to hear about the things you've been working on this week. Um, so tell us uh, who you are and what kind of work you do and the things that, uh, that, that have taken up the bulk of your time and attention this week. Um, and why don't we go ahead and start with Maya. Hey y'all, uh, my name is Maya Chavez. I am a teacher in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and this week, as with many weeks, I've been focused on trying to advocate about the health and safety concerns I have uh, for students within the Providence District and also across Rhode Island. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of advocacy around that uh, and I'm really glad to be here today. Great, Maya, thanks for joining us. And Kit? Hi everybody, I'm Kit. Um, I'm working at a private school in the greater Boston area this year, and I would say that the last week I've spent a lot of time thinking about how we record data and give feedback to students that is meaningful to them and helps them really understand like where they are, what they know, and how to move forward from there. Terrific. That's great. And Michael? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Michael Machado. I teach social studies at uh, an alternative high school that's just north of Denver. Um, this past week has really been an opportunity to reset with my students from a social emotional standpoint. Um, and so that's been the focus of my work in trying to get um, back to an even keel in the room. So will you, will you tell us what you mean by a reset? Because you all have been in school for a few weeks now. <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, it, the the at atmosphere in the room has just gotten sort of heavier and heavier as the weeks have passed on. Um, and I had to just put a pause on content and, and have an honest conversation with, the, with my students about what's going on and trying to understand where they're coming from. What do you need from me? Um, how do we get back to a space that feels more um, welcoming and, and conducive to learning? Uh, and so it was a lot of uh, tough conversations and then adjustments to pedagogy. That's great, Michael. Thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Um, and Natasha? Hey, everyone. So my name is Natasha Estevez. I'm a research assistant at the MIT Teaching Systems Lab and a graduate student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I do want to name that um, I did not lead, I co-led. Um, I, I certainly did not do this alone this past summer. As you can see, there's many authors on this report. And I just wanted to humbly state that it has been um, an honor working on it. And um, what I've been thinking about this week, aside from the um, massive amounts of course load and work that I have for my classes is, I've been looking forward to this webinar and uh, the opportunity to, to hopefully do justice to um, all the teachers that I interviewed. Um, we interviewed about 57 teachers for the study. I interviewed about 22 and analyzed 25 of those transcripts. And it's very important to me that um, we uplift those teachers' voices today. So I've been thinking a great deal about making sure that I do justice to all the teachers that so gracefully um, gave their time to us and opened up to us for an hour of their week. Great. Um, well, that's what we're here to do. Um, and, and we have been in this report and what we want to do moving forward from there. Um, so, uh, you know, at the Teaching Systems Lab over the last 18 months, we've dropped um, quite a bit of what we normally do. What we actually, <laughs> what we're sort of normally meant to do is to design the future of teacher learning um, and to help think about new and dynamic ways for teachers to learn and get better in their work. Um, but about 18 months ago, uh, the world began to fall apart um, and we realized, well, A, that a bunch of the research that we had planned wasn't gonna work uh, because we were gonna be in, in shrouded in chaos for what we probably thought was weeks or months of the time and has proven to be years. Um, but also we just thought it was incredibly important to document Meant what was happening in schools um, to and to help under in particular to help understand the experiences of pandemic learning as viewed through students and teachers own experiences 
Um, you know, there are a lot of researchers who have jumped in to ask questions of, uh, you know, are our schools open or closed or how? Um, what do standardized assessments say about um, students' performance on those assessments? And there's, I think, some valuable things that we can learn from answering those questions. Um, but learning, all learning in schools happens in a place uh, that uh, uh, Richard Elmore, a great uh, Harvard Graduate School professor, called the Instructional Core. And the instructional core is where students and teachers and the resources they use to learn interact. And there's pretty much no learning that happens outside of that instructional core. There's all kinds of activity, you know, like boilers get turned on and AC gets turned off in the winter and buses move people around and taxes are collected and things like that. Budgets are made. Um, but if you want to look at where teaching and learning happens, it all happens with those interactions from teachers and students. Um, so we've published five reports now, um, and this, which you can find at tsl.mit.edu slash COVID-19. Um, and the fifth of these is a set of interviews that we conducted in the spring of this year, sort of roughly from April to May. Uh, as Natasha mentioned, we interviewed 57 people, um, and the report has some descriptions of who they are. But generally speaking, we tried to talk to teachers in lots of different circumstances. So we talked to teachers in all different parts of the country, working in public, private, and charter schools, and elementary, middle, and high school, teaching all kinds of different subjects, including special education teachers, people from um, different genders, different racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, and we asked them, uh, you know, a sort of a, a set of questions that basically boiled down to kind of what's been going, you know, what's supposed to be happening in your classroom this past year? What's actually happening? Um, what's working? What's hard? And what do you think about doing differently and better in the future? Um, Natasha, do, can you tell us a little bit about just your experiences doing those interviews? Like, as you were talking to teachers, what jumped out at you as being sort of most top of mind as you were talking to them? Or what, what were some of your experiences as you were talking to folks um, during this period in April and May? Well, for one, those were the questions we went in asking our teachers, all right? Um, but there are a lot of other uh, themes that emerged, you know, throughout our conversations, which were often very organic, especially since I'm a former teacher myself. And, um, you know, I, I know I keep, I've kept on saying this all summer, and our report really highlights this. But, you know, my, my gut instinct, you know, in answering your question is the lack of teacher input and decision making. So one thing that jumped out almost across the board, there isn't a single teacher um, that I interviewed um, and that I, my colleagues interviewed that felt heard, that felt seen, that felt respected, that felt valued as a thought partner in the decision-making processes for how to respond to the pandemic. So uh, that is one big takeaway. The other big takeaway, and there are many takeaways, <laughs> but the other big takeaway is just how creative teachers got and how hard they were working and how incredibly like diametrically opposed that was to the dominant narrative that, oh, teachers just want to work remotely because it's easier. You know, it's easier to work remotely. Actually, it was significantly more difficult to work remotely. And teachers were figuring a lot of things out on their own. I mean, I've had teachers even share with me that the most they got was like a YouTube tutorial on how to use Zoom, but nothing on like online pedagogy, right? Or there were curricula that was or, or learning management systems that were like, here, use this, but no training for it. So everything, you know, was what I got from teachers, aside from the emotional strain of having to teach during a pandemic and seeing their students lose grandparents. One teacher mentioning that they saw their student lose like, like there was like 11 losses in one year. And that was more than she had experienced in 15 years of teaching. So on top of all that emotional turmoil, there was this sense of not being respected as a degree professionals that they were when decisions were being made in a very top down way. Um, that is something that reoccurred a lot throughout these interviews. So Kit, I saw you nodding as Natasha was talking. Um, what what of what she was just telling about stories talking to 60 teachers sort of resonated in your own experience? I mean, feeling like I wasn't consulted about anything. And, you know, I was sort of flashing back to the last week of like March, March 13th was the last day that I was in person with my students sort of pre-pandemic. And I just 
remember some of the kids sort of being like, what's going to happen? Are we having school next week? Are we not having school next week? And I was sort of like, you know, I don't know. And I'll share with you like updated information when I figure out what's happening. But, you know, people are making decisions and they're, you know, changing their minds. So I don't want to tell you something right now. And then it's changed by Monday. And so like I had to, you know, provide that uh, stability for my students because their fears as 13 year olds are like liable to go sort of out of control. But meanwhile, on the back end, I'm sitting there going, I have no idea. Are we going to be in school on Monday? Maybe, maybe not. And in fact, we weren't. Um, but we only found out that we weren't going to be on like Sunday night because it, it felt like the people who were making the decisions about what schools were doing were not any of the people who were in schools doing the work itself. Maya, you mentioned in your uh, in your your work this week that you were doing some advocacy and some organizing to, you know, I mean, it, it sounds to me a little bit like Natasha's saying, I don't think people are listening enough to teachers. And you're sort of saying, well, it doesn't matter if they're listening to us or not, because we're going to make ourselves heard. Can you tell us a little bit about the sort of advocacy and organizing you're doing? Like when you want to say, when you say you want to make people more attentive to health and safety concerns of students, like what does that look like in your practice? That is like such a big and complex question. So I might struggle to sort of answer that in any sort of a concise way. Um, I guess, um, you know, similarly um, to, to Kit who was just speaking, we went uh, remote in March of 2020. Um, and at that point I'm like, okay, public health scientists like are doing this. This is not something that I need to be super concerned about. Um, and then I saw the first draft of Providence Schools uh, school reopening plan which did not include a mask mandate. It did not include stable groups. It did not include a lot of basic mitigations. Um, and that to me was a red flag. That to me was like, if people are even going to present us with a document that doesn't have a mask mandate that we need to stand up uh, and make our voices heard and make our concerns heard. So it, at that point I was like, all right, the epidemiologists clearly are not involved in all at all in this work because this document is blatantly unsafe, even to me as someone with a liberal arts and a teaching degree. Um, so that's when I really started to um, advocate um, and speak out about some of the concerns that I had and started looking more at some of the data. And something that was really helpful to me in that is actually connected with someone here in Providence who's a social epidemiologist. Um, and she and I wrote an op-ed together, which no one was interested in publishing, but that's okay. I learned a lot through that work um, and since have continued uh, to organize, whether it was by sharing concerns, documentation of conditions in the schools um, on social media, talking to local reporters, um, speaking at meetings of the Rhode Island Department of Education. Um, I've organized teachers, parents, students to speak uh, about our concerns there. Um, and at the school board as well. Um, I actually um, have criticized Emily Oster so much on Twitter that I ended up getting interviewed in the New York Times about it. Um, so I leverage social media a lot to, to try and elevate the concerns that I have had, uh, but I continue to be disappointed by, I think, the lack of uh, wider regard and concern for the persistent uh, health issues in our schools. Thanks, Maya. And, and Michael, for you, what 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 have been the what have been the venues for in your work to be able to you know like like as you're you, you know you talked about sort of doing a reset right now? Um, do you feel like you have open lines of communication with folks in your school and your district about doing that? Do you feel like it's something that you're mostly doing in your own classroom and figuring out on your own? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And and um, also, you know, before I say anything else, I just want to thank you and everyone that was involved with it, with this work for doing this. It, it felt like um, the first time I had been heard, the first time I had been seen in a long time. In this. So I, I just want to say thanks. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, are the lines of communication open? Yes. Um, the, I, you know, at different stages of this, I've tried every... Uh, line of communication I could think of. I've tried speaking to the Board of Education, um, not 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 quite so thoroughly as Maya, so hats off to Maya because that's awesome, the work that she was describing. Um, but it just, it didn't feel effective. 
Um, it didn't feel that no matter how sort of eloquent you were or how data driven you were or how um, how many sites or sources you use, it just was irrelevant. It just was not really the the metrics by which the decisions were being made. And that feels like it continues to be the case. I think that for me, um, in, in much the same way that like you, you, you're sort of forced to accept that inequitable con conditions outside of the school have a, a direct and significant impact on your students, um, you know, academic success, social, emotional um, success, and so on and so forth. Within COVID-19, it felt to me that the only way that I could really create any sort of meaningful impact was to address my students directly um, and to create a sort of um, um, and sort of an ethos appeal, I suppose, um, to my students that was structured around the fact that, you know, I have a young son that I can't vaccinate. Um, and that one of the biggest concerns I have is, is having an asymptomatic case, a breakthrough case of COVID-19 and bringing it, um, and bringing it home. Um, and so that's sort of been effective, um, not as effective as I would have hoped. Um, but, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it does for sure. You know, um, and I, I mean, one of the things that we try to emphasize in our work is that, you know, or, like organizing is not about, you know, the sort of moment of, of kind of immediately rearranging power or rearranging voices in systems. Um, you know, we, we did a whole we did a whole project um, called Imagining September, in which we asked, which we invited teachers to interview their students, um, to go and ask them five questions, uh, you know, which were basically like, what worked really well for you last year? What was really hard for last year? What do you feel like you lost? What are you super proud of? And what do you hope adults will do differently? Um, now, you know, through a, <laughs> through a strange set of circumstances, I happen to work at MIT, and sometimes if I yell things, people will pay attention or will open emails from an MIT address. Um, and so I can take, you know, and I, I also have a bunch of time to sit around and, and do all this, so I could take their, you know, 200 responses for, with ideas from 5,000 students and publish a report on it and yell about it. And that can be important and helpful. But I think just as important is another thing we told teachers was, just go ask your students those questions and really listen to them and tell one other adult. Um, you know, have that conversation with one colleague, with your assistant principal, with the counselor, with someone else. Um, what organizing is in some respects is just having enough people taking enough small scale reasonable actions within their sphere of influence to develop a sort of grassroots effort at having more and more people having those conversations. Um, so, you know, I, I think you know, the kinds of things that you're doing and the kinds of stories you're doing, you know, it, like it would be great if we could have um, interviewed a thousand teachers, but we could interview 60. So that's what we did. Um, and then we start sort of telling those stories from there. Um, you know, two of the other themes from the report, Natasha, about how teachers were kind of feeling um, were some of what Michael was just talking about, the toll of widening inequalities and society's sort of failure to respond to those inequalities, um, and the toll of public criticism of teachers. And I wonder if you could talk about some of the things that you heard about that. Yeah, I'm actually reminded of one quote. Um, well, I'll paraphrase it from one of the teachers I interviewed um, in a rural part of the country. Uh, and basically this individual said, I feel like I'm bearing the burden of a failure of public of a, of a public uh, health crisis failure. Somehow it, it falls on me as a classroom teacher to deal with the burden of, you know, those in positions of power who can actually mitigate the spread of this virus. So, you know, there's all this vitriol, all this hostility against teachers for f wanting to feel safe. And like Michael just mentioned, a lot of the teachers I interviewed also had small children at home who were unvaccinated or not, you know, able to be vaccinated or were in intergenerational generational homes and we're living with older folks this is pre-vaccination because they were reflecting back on the year and all of a sudden teachers don't have the right to feel unsafe um, in a situation where their cities their municipalities or their states aren't doing enough to mitigate the spread of this virus so in one anecdote you know this individual was talking about how nobody wanted to wear a mask um, in their small town uh, 
when football games or baseball games for the school, because it was a very big deal for the high school, were canceled, the teachers were somehow blamed. It, it just, for some reason, teachers became a scapegoat for what was like a wider societal failure to curb this pandemic spread. Um, and I, I think that shows um, two things. One, there was a lot of failure in mitigating the spread of this virus. Um, and two, we live in a country that does not value teachers as a highly degreed professionals that they are, um, that does not value them um, as even human beings, you know, that sees them as, as babysitters. Um, and therefore, you know, teachers became scapegoats for something that's beyond their control. And, you know, what's striking to me is that, you know, throughout this year, you see a lot of companies and corporations and even nonprofits seeing like, what can we do for our employees? How can we make our employees feel safe? What can we do for the morale of our employees? But there was nothing equivalent to that from the interviews that I did, at least, for teachers. There, there was no concern for how do we make teachers feel safe? It was like, what do parents want, you know, uh, but never, you know, and in, and in, um, in hearings, you know, like with school board uh, uh, council hearings, it's like, we'll listen to angry parents, but we're not going to listen to the teachers. So th this, this is a, a theme that I also, you know, noticed that was brought up over and over again. There was a public health crisis. Somehow, some way, teachers were bearing the brunt of it. Michael or Meyer, Kit, are there moments in the last year that you can remember sort of feeling, you know, what, what we call in the report, the toll of that public criticism? Are there like particular, you know, events you can realize where you read something in the news or you heard something from someone in your community that sort of stands out at you is like, oh, that was, that was one of these things that kind of stung. Yeah, Michael or? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't have, um, I, I don't have, um, a, 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 a sort of anecdote to share from my personal experience. It's all sort of things that I experienced secondhand watching the news, most especially recently uh, when boards of education are meeting to discuss, for instance, mask mandates. We had the same situation uh, with our board of education uh, in which, you know, uh, to, to Natasha's point, we have the Tri-County Health Department um, in this area of, of Denver, greater Denver, um, that implemented a mask mandate and then put an exception into it that you could that you could, if you're, if you're under the, you know, the control of the Tri-County Health Department, that you could opt out of this mask mandate, which our school promptly did for, with our, our district promptly did for students 12 and older, ostensibly because they have access to a vaccine, that they're in the midst of watching TikTok after TikTok that spreads misinformation regarding the vaccine, which is something else you're having to combat in the classroom. Um, and so it's been immensely frustrating um, and, and I would also add to, to what Natasha was saying a second ago, it was the whiplash of it, right? You go from, and this is, this is talked about in your report, you go from being a, you know, a hero effectively, which is language that I take umbrage with to begin with, um, to being the scapegoat. And that whiplash effect was really disheartening, really frustrating. Um, this is already uh, a demanding job at the best of times. And so now we're in a situation where the, 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 the toll from a mental health standpoint is exponentially higher. Uh, and that week, so, so it took about a week, right, where we saw massive upticks in, in case count incidence rate for students between 12 and 18 years old when schools opened without a mask mandate here. And it took about a week before the district decided to opt into the mask mandate. Now you have one of the things that's most challenging with students, which is inconsistency. You've got a rule change a week into the school year, and now it's just been a constant battle of please cover your nose, please cover your nose. You explain the science of it, uh, and it's just, it's a lot. Yeah, it was safe last week, and now it's not safe anymore. Is it, you know, and you, I mean, you can see a 13 year old, like you just told me it was one thing and now you're telling me another thing. And, you know, who am I supposed to believe? What kind, you know, who are the experts that are out there? Kit, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, last year in New York City, where I was teaching, one of the options for both students and teachers was a fully remote option. 
And I was actually co-teaching with somebody who was in person and she was the special education math teacher. I was the general ed math teacher and our kids sort of rotated through uh, like a third of them in person on A days and a third of them in person on B days and then a third of them who were fully remote the whole time. And over the summer, there was like a holding of the breath to see if a remote option would be offered again in New York. And parents, especially in the Bronx, were saying, hey, we need a remote option. And teachers were saying, hey, we need a remote option. And the mayor doesn't care. It, like, he's not listening. And I've been a New York City public school teacher for 11 years, and I made the decision that I didn't feel safe going back in person, and I didn't want to not be heard by the people who had the power to make decisions like that. So I went to a private school. And at the private school, the head of the school consults with uh, medical professionals. They overhauled the HVAC system like summer of 2020 before they even went back last year. We have a mask mandate. We have a vaccine mandate for teachers and students over 16. Like we're doing full campus testing after basically every like holiday. Um, and then like anybody who is asymptomatic and has a case is doing like test and stay. And I legitimately don't have to worry as much about COVID. I can focus on teaching. I can focus on like the relationship building with the students and supporting them and reassuring them that they're not as behind as they fear they might be because of what they're hearing in the news. And I, I'm angry that that's not available for all students in public school, that I had to leave the public school system to go somewhere that I felt like I was going to be able to be safe and my family would be safe and my kids would be safe. And, you know, even with the mask mandate, um, and it's for everybody, regardless of vaccination status, if you're inside a building, masks are on. If you're outside a building, masks are optional. And so we've been doing like a lot of eating outdoors and, you know, uh, that kind of thing. But students, for the most part, when you go inside, are responsive to like putting the mask on. There are definitely a few who are resistant, but not to the percent or degree that I saw like last year in the public school or that I'm seeing even more so this year in the public schools. Mm. Natasha, did you want to follow up? Um, it was a follow up to Michael's point. You, we can circle back to me. I, I'd love to know if Maya wants to jump in. Sure, yeah. So um, I definitely had um, a number of experiences um, where I was targeted, um, particularly on Twitter, uh, for some of my advocacy. Um, I mean, there's there are enormous efforts to spread disinformation and target uh, teachers on Twitter. Um, I think what, what stood out to me was when it was actual parents in the Providence School District who made comments to me like, girl, spelled G-U-R-L, you're a public health threat. I'm like, first of all, Susan, I'm not your girl. Um, and secondly, I'm like, I, I have nothing to gain and in fact, a lot to lose from this advocacy. Um, and to put an enormous amount of time into organizing people to write letters and make phone calls and, and give public testimony um, and speaking with, with all of these reporters and you know, writing pieces with scientists, um, to put all of this energy into it and have somebody whose child attends school in my district turn around and say that I personally, myself, am the public health threat um, was really deeply disturbing, particularly this, because this is an individual who considers herself a progressive um, and, and, and allies, you know, um, with progressive organizations here in the community. So that to me really um, highlighted the extent to which people have been deeply misinformed about the real risks in our schools. I think that is, that's part of the reason it became um, the conversation so often is, is, is framed as teachers versus parents. Well, parents actually want to keep their kids safe. It's not that parents wanna put their kids at risk and wanna put their kids' teachers at risk. It's that many parents have been deeply misinformed about the situation in our schools. So like my school district stayed open in person the entire school year last year. 
even when our per capita rates soared to nine and a half times the rate that was allowed for reopening in the fall. And now leaders point to Providence schools and they, they wrote about it in you know, the New York Times and other places and say like, look how we kept schools open. Look how we kept going during the pandemic. Look at this, this great sacrifice and this great success. And this, this proves that really we can keep schools open. Right, but if you look at what the CDC has to say, they looked at national surveillance data from the UK, which showed that for every increase of five in the per capita rate, right, the rate per 100,000 people of new cases, every increase of five, there was a 72% increase in the likelihood of a school outbreak, or an increase of five. Now, where I am, we had an increase of 850 per 100,000. And we stayed open the entire time. Like you don't have to be an epidemiologist to understand that that is clearly unsafe and that we were clearly at enormous risk. And rather than acknowledging that there's science and data that show that in-person learning can be a source of community transmission, that it can actually drive community transmission, particularly when you have a lot of students who are living in intergenerational homes. Instead of acknowledging science, they turn around and point at all of our lives being put at risk and say, what a great success it was. And then we, when we try to advocate, you know, like, um, like uh, Michael was saying, when we try to advocate, we're dismissed because we're not scientists, because we're not epidemiologists, you know? And when you say, cool, I have three epidemiologists who are willing to talk to you and elevate these concerns, those are not the scientists who get included in the New York Times article. Instead, it's, you know, Emily Oster, the economist, who is advancing the narrative that we should reopen schools at any cost and that children are not at risk from COVID. So I think it's been, um, it's been a fraught experience for, for many reasons. <laughs> no, thanks for sharing that, Maya. Yeah, Justin, can I share something real quick? Yeah. It's just that um, I'm, I'm reminded of a, interviewee of mine that shared something that I found very powerful, um, especially as a former teacher. This individual said something along the lines of like, I am literally trained to protect your child from an active shooter. We do active shooter drills to literally save your, child, your child's life from gun violence which is so prevalent in our country. And I have you know, been through those active shooter drills, which are very traumatizing to be quite honest for students and teachers. Um, and this in individual said, I'm here ready to save your child's life from a bullet. And yet you can't empathize with the fact that I don't wanna end up in a ventilator. You know, so this like this disconnect of, you know, this was around the time where there was a shift from yes, celebrate teachers to all oh, teachers are selfish. Um, and back to a few of the points that the teachers here have have made there. It's been very painful for, for a lot of the teachers. I mean, it's been unanimously painful, really. There are very few things that are true across the board, but the the the, the hate that was coming from media outlets or from parents especially um, was extremely demoralizing and painful, especially since teachers were working so hard and remote teaching was everything but easy. It was actually much harder than in-person teaching. Um, but, um, but I found that particular quote really, like that really resonated with me. You know, teachers have to train to, what do we do if there's an active shooter and yet we're here trying to end up on a ventilator for perfectly preventable disease and somehow that's too much to ask um, and we may talk about this later Justin so you can table this but uh, to Maya's point returning to school um, was far from normal anyway a lot, of, a lot of people thought that oh yeah we're going to return to school we're let, let's, go, let's get back to normal there's no normal there was no normal in returning to school. Um, and there were things that was work that were working about remote teaching and learning. There was a groove that a lot of teachers found. And then administrators, uh, without consulting teachers, this is a trend we found, would be like, all right, we're arbitrarily going to re return in this day, whether or not the data supports it. But it's like, I just got a way of like managing my classroom behavior online. I just got a I just got a groove going with my class and turning things in through digital formats to then suddenly change to in-person learning meant relearning procedures, meant reestablishing or rebuilding relationships. Um, so the, the return to in-person learning not only made teachers feel incredibly unsafe, which obviously affects their work performance, um, but wasn't necessarily, you know, like a panacea for, 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 for education during a pandemic. You know, one thing that I've been thinking about in terms of the, the public criticism um, 
is to is to try to understand sort of how widespread that criticism is or sort of what you know what what sense do we have of how parents and how you know people in the United States overall feel about schools feel about their teachers feel about teacher unions and a thing that's been really striking to me especially watching survey data come out in the last um, couple of months you know from the end of last year is the incredibly stable support for schools um, so a weird thing about American survey polling um, is that if you ask uh, people in the United States what they think about public schools in general, um, they're kind of so-so on the topic. If you ask them um, what they think about their local public school, they're quite positive. Um, and none of that was dented in the last year. If you look at polling from um, Phi Delta Kappen, which is kind of like a progressive teaching, teacher support organization, um, or Education Next, which is kind of like a right, center right um, uh, organization that does polling. You know, both of their annual polls show stable support for, um, for your local public schools, um, stable support for teachers' unions. Um, and then the thing that, that has really shocked me with some of the recent surveys is when parents are surveyed, about the quality of uh, sort of their satisfaction with the instruction that their students received over last year. To my mind, it was shockingly high. 75% um, of parents, when Education Next asked them, how satisfied are you with the instruction and activities your students have received? Um, over 75% said they were satisfied or very satisfied. Um, there's another group called Reach that just had a survey come out that asked a similar kind of question um, and got similar kinds of responses. Um, there's something sort of unusual about, well, I guess I mean, part of it makes me think like there are some very, very loud um, negative voices that have been critical of teaching, critical of, um, of the positions that teachers unions have taken. Um, but actually, you know, overwhelmingly, it may be that, that the vast majority of parents are actually quite supportive. Um, of what uh, of what teachers have been up to now, unfortunately, you know, teachers who are just like generally content, you know, with how things are going in their schools and sort of you know um, satisfied with our lives, you know, don't don't write op eds to the local paper hang saying, no, I think things are pretty okay in schools. Like it's hard, uh, but they're doing their best. Um, and so it's some of these sort of negative voices that seem to shine through. But I, you know, I'm I've been I've been thinking a lot about how to communicate more widely that, yep, there are definitely some, some really loud voices that have been really critical of teachers and schools during this period, but there's actually shockingly high levels of parental support for their own teachers um, and generally very high levels and very stable levels of support for teachers and teacher unions and groups like that. Um, so there's there's one you know we just we spent a bunch of time talking about the one main theme of the report which is that teachers were closest to these issues but they often felt insufficiently heard insufficiently supported insufficiently valued um, a second argument that that we make in the report is that there are a series of missteps that in retrospect look pretty straightforward um, that could have been avoided um, if we had listened to teachers um, Natasha do you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the things were sort of in retrospect, it looks like, you know what, teachers had a bunch of concerns about these approaches, and sure enough, we tried them, and they didn't work very well. Yeah, well, it, it's hard not to tie it back to the lack of teacher input, um, but basically, when, when teachers who are closest to the I know you mentioned the instructional core, but like teachers are in the classroom. Like I had one interview, he said like, everybody wants to tell teachers what to do, but nobody knows what teaching is like, and nobody knows what teaching is like during a pandemic. So it's a very odd place to be in when you have other people telling you what to do while they're working from home and asking you to return to the classroom um, or while they're working from home and asking you to teach remotely without sufficient uh, professional development and how to do so. Um, but the, you know, but in terms of missteps that could have been avoided, um, you know, one example that I think of, you know, and I, the teachers uh, that are on our panel here perhaps could share some as well, is a teacher that had spent their entire summer, you know, and I'm trying to use gender neutral pronouns because we really wanted to protect the anonymity of all our teachers. And that's part of the reason not all of them are here. Um, really spent so much time 
you know, just listening to them describe all the time that they spent over the summer putting together uh, a plan for the school year for remote teaching. Um, finally got, you know, their groove going, because even if it's in-person teaching, you know, it takes a while for you to get the procedures, get, you know, get things going, get things, things flowing. And then three, I think it was about a month or three weeks before the end of the school year, the administrators decided, well, it's about time to go back to in-person classes. Let's do it. But it had taken so much time um, to get to the point where remote learn, where remote teaching and learning was working and learning was happening and relationship building was working out online um, that when they returned to um, in-person, well, well, not returned because they hadn't even been in in-person classroom, when they entered in-person classroom, it was just chaos. You had to like rebuild relationships, redo procedures, but the teacher had advocated for themselves, you know, to their administration, but hadn't been listened to. Um, another thing, you know, uh, that I know at least one teacher on this panel from the transcripts that I read spoke to is how absolutely untenable hybrid teaching was. And those who are outside teaching are like, yeah, 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 this is it, hybrid teaching, remote, and in person at the same time, best of both worlds, let's do it, you know? And although there's hybrid teaching in the sense of like A day, B days, right? And you alternate, a lot of the hybrid teaching that we heard about from the teachers we interviewed were simul teaching, where somehow teachers were expected to teach in-person students and online students at the same time. And you basically had to have like two different sets of lesson plans. It was incredibly difficult. It was incredibly stressful. And one group of students, there was no way that they weren't gonna be neglected because you just you just can't do it. You can't do virtual teaching and in-person teaching at the same time. So though the idea in some administrators' uh, head might've been like, oh, this is the best of both worlds. Had teachers been consulted and there were instances where teachers were saying, this isn't working, this is untenable. And they were ignored. It was like, oh, okay but we're gonna continue doing it anyway. Then these are the sorts of missteps that we could have avoided. Better teaching and learning could have happened if teachers weren't forced into arrangements that they know being closest to the issue didn't work. Yeah, hybrid teaching seems like the sort of simul teaching when you have a group of students. Go ahead, Kit. Well, I, I just wanted to speak to this because that, that was exactly my experience last year. Um, in, in New York City, my school in particular had us doing the simul teaching. So even though I was talking about A days and B days, the thing that people didn't really realize is that when the kids who were coming in in person were there, they were still doing the same lesson as the kids at home. Because in order for us to like interact with all of the kids equally, you know, we were luckily using Desmos, which is a great um, online math tool. And I've used it both before in person and then also while being sort of fully remote. But the kids who were in person weren't getting your normal in-person school experience. So it was like, okay, great. You're physically in the room, but you're not actually able to engage with each other in a one-on-one -on -one conversation because you have to be at two different tables, six feet apart. And we're still on Zoom, except that uh, I will never forget the first day that we had all the kids sign into Zoom, the Wi-Fi network at our school was like, oh my God, I can't do it. And everybody's laptop like froze. And so then we were like, okay, let's try turning off cameras. Oh, that's not going to work. Okay, let's try projecting the Zoom on the board. And then the kid who wants to speak that's in the room comes up to the teacher laptop that's in the room and like speaks to everybody, but from that laptop. And so then when we tried to do you know, we called them like a chat blast where everybody would type into the chat at the same time and then hit enter and we could like read everybody's ideas. That was a pedagogy move that we sort of created on the fly, but it didn't work if the kids who were in person couldn't access, you know, the chat for Zoom because their laptop wasn't directly connected. So it was like figuring out what's going to work for the kids who are fully remote at home, how do we bridge that with the kids who are in person, but still kind of remote? And how do we make sure that everybody is getting a good educational experience? And when we, in New York, we were fully remote for a, a short period of time. Um, I think it was like maybe November through the, the middle of February, the students, 
all had the same experience, right? They were all at home all the time. It was a lot more consistent for them. They knew what to do. We got into a groove and then we came back in person and they were sort of like, whoa, wait, I don't know what to do anymore. And I think that's another example of we were being asked to build the plane as we're already like in the air going, oh my God, I'm falling out of the sky. I don't have a plane. Well, while also sort of saying like, look, we just know that this won't work. I mean, I think there was a, sort of a right. widespread immediate reaction from teachers. Like it is almost impossible, especially if you're doing any kind of participatory instruction to have half the students be, so you can it actually, you know, I, uh, about maybe 15 years ago, I was talking to some faculty at the Harvard Extension School um, and they had some classes where you could take them on campus and then folks mostly in the military took them from a distance. Um, and they did it at the same time. And the reason why that worked is that the there was a lecturer who just stood in front of a camera in front of an audience and talked. Um, and, and if all you're doing is talking to people, it actually works pretty well. But if you're trying to have what you describe of a sort of participatory pedagogy, interacting with other students, interacting with technology online, um, it, it's, it's all, you know, teachers could sort of said, like, this is going to be impossible. Um, and there are certain kinds of administrative conveniences to having simul teaching happening. You know, it, it meant you didn't have to track just as closely, like who's coming back and who's going to be away on any given day. Like it, it was sort of a good plan, except for the fact that it was impossible to actually implement. Um, and uh, um, I think, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an example of, uh, um, of, of one of the things that had people listened more to teachers and sort of took their concerns more seriously from the beginning, um, then, uh, you know, it, it was a misstep that could have been avoided. So I want to make sure that we have some time for the third um, category of things that we found, um, which is that, you know, it was, it was a problem to not listen to teachers and to have them help us avoid some obvious missteps. But there's also some really great things that teachers learned and innovative and developed and created. Um, and we should really make sure that those good ideas get brought into um, the work of teaching moving forward. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if any of the panelists, maybe Maya or Michael, if you wanna talk about some of the things that you sort of figured out uh, last year that, you're really, that you've been really excited to bring into the work this year. Michael, do you want to start us off? Um, yeah, uh, Justin, I, I hope you don't mind. There are a couple of points I was hoping to make. Um, just Please. Um, the first one, I want to go back to what you were talking about with respect to um, the, the, the very vocal parents who are openly critical of teachers. Um, I think that I, I just want to say like any serious analysis of this problem has to include a meaningful interrogation of the fourth estate and specifically the way that the news media frames problems, frames issues in society. We have massive news conglomerates that, you know, three or four that control the vast, vast majority of media that people consume. And whether we're talking about tr traditional media or social media, until we move away from a system that is almost entirely predicated on the ability to, 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 to drive interactions through controversial content, um, I think we're in a really, really tough spot. And that the amount of attention that you're talking about to a very small minority, which is of course evidenced by the, the statistics that you reference, um, I think is, is part and parcel of that issue. Um, sorry to go to go back. No, please go back that far. Um, re regarding, I, I mean, I, I want to turn this over to Maya quickly because I don't have anything particularly innovative to offer except what was discussed at length in, in your report, which is grace and flexibility, right? Like. Um, I really think that ultimately the, the, the solutions that all of us would likely advocate for are things that are sort of fundamentally not neoliberal. They're not corporate oriented. They don't have to do with uh, your sort of ability to um, actively implement a new app, a new software suite, a new this, a new that. It has to do with meeting students where they are, with making meaningful human connections and developing relationships. All of this stuff is time consuming. And from the standpoint of the district, it's expensive. Um, and so I think that, um, I, I don't wanna take up too much more time. I know we're short, so I, I wanna turn over, but I think really like you basically hit on 
what I took away. And that has to do with um, accepting late work. It has to do with uh, emphasizing the fact that I'm not really concerned about your grade, which is not something that a lot of my students have heard before. Um, I don't really think it's always a great indicator of what you have or haven't learned. Um, and so that's where, that's where I live on that piece. That's great, Michael. Maya, do you have thoughts, Dad? Yeah, actually, I want to kind of build on Michael's point about um, sort of how these conversations have been represented in the media, because uh, like Michael was saying, I think that, that what we see reported in the mainstream uh, news is very far removed and a very distorted version of reality. I don't have parents of my actual students who are on Twitter talking about teachers are bad people, this, that, and the other. They're, they're taking care of their children and working their jobs. Um, but there is this perception that there's this massive backlash against teachers. Um, and it's a very well-funded um, perception. Um, and I think a lot of the folks who are pushing the idea that children don't actually get COVID, that they don't need to get vaccines, um, that we shouldn't be teaching about critical race theory. Um, a lot of the same organizations um, are behind all of these narratives, right? The Koch Institute, the AIER are funding these ideas. Um, and it's really essential that we delve further into the sources of this misinformation. I mean, the former head psychologist of Cambridge Analytica is deeply involved in a COVID disinformation campaign in the UK that has targeted members of parliament, that has worked inside um, nonprofit, um, like astroturfed uh, parent organizations in the UK. I mean, that is the level of misinformation that, that we're actually combating. You know, when, when somebody from Cambridge Analytica or formerly of Cambridge Analytica is directly targeting teachers, parents, teachers unions, members of parliament, that's what we're up against. That's how distorted the narrative is. And until we start to really unpack that, uh, I think it's, it's going to be difficult to address some of the, the things that are brought up in these conversations because the conversations aren't indicative of, of, of our um, realities. You know, and I think um, seeing the extent to which a lot of the activity online um, was was fake activity, there were a lot of fake accounts like pushing these narratives, pu pushing these agenda. Um, we need to think about the ways in which that has distorted our understanding of not only the science of COVID safety, but also our understanding of what other people in our society think. Because when you open up Emily Oster's Twitter and you see all of these people that are like, yeah, let's do open the schools right now. Kids don't need, you know, your child is an unvaccinated, it's like a vaccinated grandparent. When you see this huge response to that, you think, okay, I must be the weird one. Everybody must think that, you know, but similarly um, to, to what Justin was saying about you know, when you actually look at the data, parents are very supportive of teachers. They're happy with the education their kids are getting. When you actually look at, this, at the data on what people want in terms of public health, they want more interventions. They want more safety. They don't want people to be put at risk. Yet, we're acting based on, you know, these, these sort of um, astroturfed online um, movements. And we need to really consider, reconsider the ways that we're, we're getting information and the ways in which we're understanding conversations about schools and teacher, teaching and learning. Yeah, Michael. Sorry, just quickly to add on to that. And, I, and Maya, I'm sure can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but as far as I'm aware, the only traditional news media figure that is engaged with Emily Oster's work on, on, on TV is Chris uh, Hayes. And uh, am I saying that guy's name right? Chris Hayes, the guy on MSNBC, the young guy? Um, and even he, if you go back and look at his Twitter feed, even he was kind of like wishy-washy on Emily Oster and, and the whole thing, which was pretty disappointing. Um, but I, just quickly, this last thing, um, to, to my mind, um, the, the status quo um, becoming the dominant hegemonic influence that it is didn't happen by accident. Now, ultimately, what I think we're seeing here is a reaction to the perception of a threat. Right. If NEA called for a, a universal teaching strike tomorrow, we now know the kind of power that teachers have uh, economically in this country to bring the entire workforce to a halt. Um, and that is a threat to the sets a threat to capital. Right. So that's why we see threats from the side of Koch brothers. We see uh, neoliberals talking about we got to get schools open. We got to get schools open. And ultimately, what we're hearing is the voice of capital. Thanks, Michael. Um, we have a couple minutes left. Oh, Kit, go ahead. I just, I just wanted to say, Michael was just saying about the like getting schools open, and I taught fully remote last year. I never like met my students in person, and yet 
I still forged relationships with them and supported their math learning. And I think that narrative of like schools being closed misses so much. School doesn't happen in a building, right? School happens between the teacher, the student and the curriculum. And that can happen sort of regardless of where we physically are. And I think, you know, to, to a point that you raised earlier, Justin, you were talking about the sort of online course that works in college is usually just a lecturer and thinking sort of developmentally about the K through 12 education experience. You know, a lot of our pedagogy is focused on how do people interact with each other? We're teaching kids how to do a turn and talk when we're there in person. Well, last year we had to teach them how to do a breakout room right? What do I do? How do I interact with my peers in this setting? And students learned a lot about how to use technology. And that's something that maybe they might not have in previous years. Um, this year, I have students where on like the second day of school, I was like, great, take out your laptops and do this. And they all did it just fine. Whereas in other years, I would have said that and it would have been like me going around troubleshooting, how do I use a laptop? I don't even know. Um, so I, I think that we're thinking about, you know, loss or being closed. And we're not recognizing that things were different and different things were emphasized or focused on. But kids were still growing. Kids were still learning. And if anything, the biggest thing that we sort of lost was this like open purpose social interaction, right? Like the, hey, hello in the, in the hallway or the, you know, conversation at the end of school when they're being dismissed and not so much the content that you can either calculate or look up or research, right? It was those human interactions that I think our kids missed the most. You know, and what's so Im incredibly important about trying to understand that stuff is, you know, high quality learning builds on where students are at, as all of you said. And if students have new capacities, we should be building on new, new capacities. If they learn stuff, um, you know, starting the year saying, what are you missing and how do you fix what's wrong with you? Um, you know, there's a role to play in helping kids get the things that they need to be successful. Um, but that, you know, none of us want to start our year being told we're learning losers um, and we need to, um, you know, get ourselves fixed. We want to start by celebrating all the incredible things that we did do and the resilience we showed and how we figure these things out. All right, we're right at the top of the hour. So Natasha, you get the final word um, to say what you want to say, and then we'll say goodbye and thank you to everybody for joining us. That's a lot of pressure. Um, there's just so much in this report uh, that we that we just we really just skimmed the surface. So I dropped it in the chat. I'm going to drop it in the chat again. Um, and I highly encourage anybody on this call to go ahead and take a look at the report. Uh, but in terms of this last slide that you have that you have up, Justin, um, teachers did innovate, and I think that's something that was overlooked. So the the teachers shouldn't have to be focused on resiliency. Students shouldn't have to be focused on resiliency. Like you should not have to be in survival mode in your job, right? Um, so that, I just wanted to preface with that because we hear a lot about like, oh my gosh, but they were so resilient. Well, we systems should be set in place so that they should not have to practice so much resiliency in the first place. Nevertheless, the fact is, you know, teachers felt strained um, and um, felt unheard and felt demoralized in many ways um, and weren't listened to. Okay, that being said, uh, there are a lot of creative ways and a lot of like novel um, uh, just ideas that teachers came up with that um, they informed us they would be carrying over to the following year. One of them is that a lot of times for like IEP meetings or um, teacher parent meetings, we don't have parents showing up because the time, the distance, transportation, buses, that's like not a thing. But now it's Zoom meetings. Everybody's comfortable with Zoom meetings. And now you can hold IEP meetings or parent-teacher conferences over Zoom. The growth in technology skills among students is something that also we heard across the board that can continue in in-person classrooms. You know, a lot of people started using Scratch for the first time, which is a coding app developed at MIT, in fact. Um, a lot of teachers realized that they can organize everything around Google Classroom and they're carrying around less 
papers. Uh, so there are certain things about technology, about digital learning that can transfer over uh, back to in-person schooling once this pandemic is over. But every single teacher that we interviewed, um, almost every single teacher we interviewed said that as much as they preferred remote learning because it was safer, you know, they're in this for the human relationship, for the connection with students. Um, and they miss that very much. And so they're looking very much, you know, looking forward very much to a future where you can be back in school and be safe and be respected and be a partner in decision making processes that affect your life um, and your classroom and your students. And I think what we need is a paradigm shift, a cultural paradigm shift and seeing teachers as a like at the has the highly degreed professionals that they are um, and a shift at the micro level where there isn't so much of a gap between administrators and teachers, between district level leaders and teachers. Um, it, it has been very hierarchical with some teachers even complaining that their unions aren't listening to them. So there needs to be a change. Teachers are professionals. Teachers are experts and they need to be seen as such. And they need to be thought partners in decision-making processes that affect how their classroom is run. Um, and that's what we hope this paper you know, could do is elevate these teachers' voices and influence policymakers and decision-makers to start rethinking how they incorporate teachers into their decision-making. Well, um, Maya and Kit and Michael, thanks so much for joining us for a really rich conversation. Natasha, thanks for uh, uh, getting on the soapbox at the end. Um, to point us in the right direction moving forward um, and for all of your terrific work uh, along with these great co-authors um, uh, on this report with Chris and Farah and Aisha and Rayleigh and Harley. Um, so you can find all of our work at tsl.mit.edu slash COVID-19. Um, we're going to send around the recording of this as it finishes, so you're free to share that uh, with other folks. Um, thanks so much for spending your evenings with us, uh, and I hope you have uh, a great uh, rest of your uh, morning, afternoon, or night, depending on where you are in the world. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much.